So I'm here to talk about, not to talk about technology. I'm here to talk about your customers, okay? So how many of you have customers? Okay, you're in the right room in the right audience, right? Um, and so I, I see a lot of familiar faces. Most of you know me from Forrester. I left Forrester, newsflash, just in case you didn't know, right? Um, it's been an interesting journey leaving Forrester. And so what I'm focused on now is, uh, is a startup. Actually, I wear two hats. One, I launched a new startup called Digital Fast Forward, and it's all about digital skills acceleration, right? And I'll talk about why I did this in a little bit. My other hat is I'm an entrepreneur in residence now at American University where I help startups get going, right? Giving them advice, feedback on how do you, how do you form the right business model? How do you scale your business model? How do you get funding? All of this fun stuff, right? So I feel like I live in two worlds, right? I'm in this kind of my, my old BPM world. I can't stand in front of that or I go blind. Uh, my old BPM world where I'm trying to help BPM teams shift to this new world. But then on Wednesdays or Thursdays, I'm talking to 21-year-olds and trying to explain to them, like, no, you shouldn't put that much money in buying coffee every day, right? <laughs> Something like that, right? Um, and so it's kind of a weird world. Like I was telling my co-founder, like, man, we gotta figure this out because it's, I'm getting uh, multiple personality disorder, right? It's really tough. Um, but when I left Forrester, I actually took about four months off, right? Just kind of clear my head, like if you guys, there's a lot of analysts in here, but you guys know, I think I've, I was an analyst for seven years and was just like, okay, I need to take a break and figure out what do I want to do with my life. So I ended up just traveling a lot, right? So I went and visited a good friend of mine, actually my co-founder now, in South Africa, right? Went on safari, and this is the second time we'd, we'd gone on safari, I'd gone and visited him there. And it was just amazing. How many of you have been to South Africa or anywhere in Africa and gone on safari? Right? It's just amazing, right? My buddy has a, a Discovery, one of these Land Rovers. You can drive right next to the animals and all of this. And I'm like, shit, this is crazy, <laughs> right? I'm like, all right. Uh, and I, I'd done this the year before, but this year, last year when I went, it was really interesting because we got so close to the animals. And the animals started running <laughs> right next to the car. And I'm like, OK, dude, you, we need to just stop and get away from animals, but what it made me think about on that trip was just seeing these herds of, of wildebeest, herds of, there were some zebra, different animals running, seeing these herds, it definitely made me think about BPM. You guys didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> I love it. You guys are like, whoa, whoa, okay, I was with you, Clay, but now, but it, it made me think about BPM in the sense, it just, I had this vision of if you think about the, you guys have seen this, I'm sure, on Animal Planet or one of these shows of the wildebeest crossing the Serengeti, right? And they get to this water hole or this river, right? And they got to cross the river, right? A lot of them don't make it over, right? And it just made me think about BPM in the sense that, right, 75% of the programs out there aren't going to survive this migration we're going through. Right? And this is when I left Forrester, this was the thing that stuck with me. This is really what caused me to leave Forrester, was the more companies I talked to that were BPM, had a BPM program, or were driving BPM, as I talked to them, they were just struggling with, we know digital's number one priority, we're trying to make the shift, but we can't make it. Someone said earlier, I think it was Nathaniel said, it, or, or, yeah, I think it was Nathaniel was saying, it's just hard, like a lot of companies look at this and say digital makes sense. We did a, before I left Forrester, we did a survey that found that digital business and digital transformation was the number one priority for BPM teams, right? Number one priority. But when I talk to teams, they're just banging their heads like, how do I do this? What do I do, right? Asking for help from vendors, asking for help from me, I guess I just said, you know what, I need to go outside of Forrester and help them <laughs> in a different way. And so this was a prediction that I made before I left Forrester. 
And this is based on a lot of the client calls, customer interaction that I had. So we know we're going through this, uh, this big transition, right? Everybody knows it. You heard it this morning. Neil's talking about it. Nathaniel's talking about it. Uh, World Economic Forum put out this report. How many of you have seen this report from World Economic Forum, the Fourth Industrial Revolution? What's interesting in this report isn't so much that they point out this, you know, we're going through this Fourth Industrial Revolution of cyber physical systems. A lot of that's what you heard this morning earlier. What was interesting is some of the data behind the new skills that would have to evolve to be able to deliver this, right? And so you saw one of the examples uh, they showed was in 2015, creativity was listed as number 10, the number 10 most critical skill to drive digital transformation, right? Or to drive to this new vision. In 2020, they were projecting that creativity would be number three, actually. Not, not quite one, but that's a big jump over five years that we have to build creativity. And it seems obvious, but if you talk, again, talk to companies, they're not able to figure this out yet. How do we get creativity, right? And I, I love this quote. This is from, uh, <laughs> I was at a, a customer advisory board for a vendor, right? And this, uh, the vendor was talking about how great their technology is. You guys love doing that, right? Uh, how great their technology is. Um, and just going on and on about the technology. And this customer stood up and he said, look, you guys used to be innovative, but now I'm competing against all these, these, these startups where they hire these kids out of college and they're drinking loads of Mountain Dew. And I was just like, oh wow, <laughs> like he said it, right? And that's, that's, and I'm seeing the same thing in, in kind of the two worlds I live in is it's becoming, definitely becoming fiercer and fiercer in terms of building and re maintaining, retaining digital talent. But this is the big challenge that I hear from clients when I was at Forrester and even now, right, is they're trying to figure out how do we build these skills so that we can go and drive it. We get the technology part. Most of them get the technology part. What they don't get is, how do we get the skill set? How do we get the right new practices in place, right? How do we get cases of Mountain Dew in-house to speed all this up, right? And so we see this, right? Digital gold rush. This is what we're, kind of the era we're in, right? Everybody has their pitchforks. Let's go, right? Around technology, startup, customer experience. We've been talking about this for the last few years, but obviously, there's also this digital drought that we have to address, right? Less than 20% of companies have the internal skills and cultures needed to drive digital innovation. This number isn't getting much better. You guys have heard me talk about this, right? That's, that comes from Forrester. So we have this gold rush, we have this drought, and what I'm starting to focus on now is what I'm recalling the digital workforce, right? And the digital workforce is the people, the practitioners, the leaders, the users, everybody in a company that are empowered to define, shape, and execute the strategy for engaging and delighting customers across existing and emerging digital channels. This is the big challenge. How do we empower people to go do this? I mean, this, this stuff is hard. What Neil was talking about earlier, right? You probably have to hire an army of uh, consultants to go do it, right? I mean, promote like, I love it, right? Like, this is great business, right, right, right? But the challenge is the companies internally have to have the skill sets to be able to take advantage of some of the self-service, to be able to design and define some of these new systems. And so this is a big challenge that we see. So when I say digital workforce, right, I think when I first started talking about this, most people were like, yeah, you're talking about this, right? I'm like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about the dude that created this, right? We have to start focusing on how do we build that guy, right? Yeah, we'll get to Skynet. Skynet. Skynet will kill the world. We'll get to the singularity in due time, right? But I can't, what was the guy's name? Any Terminator fans in here? Dyson, Dyson right. Who won? I'll throw you some money or something, right? Um, and so that's really what we're trying to focus on and what we have to do as an industry, as a market, is 
how do we get this guy the skills that he needs so he can build this dude, right, and kill us, <laughs> right? <laughs> Ultimately, that's what, we're, that's what we got to work on, right? We got to get there at some point. And so this all sounds great theory. Yeah, Clay, we hear you, we hear you. There's companies that get it, right? AT&T, this is a really good article in New York Times. Actually, there was a HBR uh, article similar earlier towards the end of last year on how AT&T is investing heavily to re-educate their workforce for digital, right? They're spending 8K per employee, $8,000 per employee for employees to go back, learn coding skills. They actually have a partnership with Udacity uh, where they created a, a digital or a online Masters of Computer Science program. So as a, an employee, you can go through this program and you can actually get a degree in nanotechnology, you can, or you can get a nano degree is what it's actually called, nano degree uh, in, in AI, in driverless cars, automation, all of that. Uh, but it's really cool what they're doing, and it's their entire workforce they're focused on. It's really interesting. If you get a chance to read the New York Times article, it's funny because the CEO's brother works, at, works for AT&T also, and the brother was like, yeah, I don't believe in all this stuff. I've, I've been putting pots in, and I, you know, copper is all I'm about, and I don't care if he's my brother. I, I'm just not going to take any of this newfangled technology stuff. And then the CEO, uh, AT&T CEO, yeah, he's probably not going to make it, <laughs> right? He's not going to make it. My brother's always been like that. I have no problem with firing him, right? So there's companies that get it, that are re-educating their workforce. They're not just going out hiring people and saying, hey, we're just going to use that as a strategy or outsourcing everything. Uh, they're actually retraining, investing in their workforce. There's companies that don't get it. Anybody fly United here? <laughs> I, I did too. I, I feel bad that I... But anybody, if you did fly United, just see if you can identify with this. I was really paying attention to what was going on with the stewardesses the whole time. I was like, you not get my seat. I'm near a window. There's two people over here, right? But it's like they, United and companies where it's really just about transaction, interaction. You know, we're not going to invest in our staff. And it was really interesting, all the articles that came out after this United issue talking about how other uh, companies, other uh, airlines are using technology to drive gamification to help understand, well, what would people pay, right? And that's about experimentation and having the right mindset and investing in, in people around the digital experience, right? So, so some companies get it, some companies don't. Right? And we see companies taking different strategies, different approaches to this. Hire new talent, go out and try to hire your way out of it, uh, reinvent the workforce, or outsource innovation. My recommendation is try to take all three approaches. Right? You need people internally that can deliver this stuff. You want to make sure you're hiring fresh new talent to keep things fresh, uh, and then outsource innovation. And I'm talking to you as if I'm talking to your customer. These are things that we have to think about as an industry in terms of helping our customers, right? So this is me jumping out of a plane. This is part of my four month uh, journey to freedom. That's what I think I had at Clay's f journey to freedom tour, right? <laughs> no, you don't, you don't deserve that, sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. I have, to, I have to say this was a really great experience. I think it, it scared me because I got like really calm and like, I'm in the right place right now, right? Like almost meditative before the jump. I think even the guy that was jumping with me was like, are you okay? Like, did you take anything? <laughs> right? And I'm like, hey, I'm good. Um, but I guess I, I, I want to share this because I get, a lot of, I get a lot of questions from people especially right after I left for it's like, well, how did you leave? Like, seems like you had a good setup, all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you know. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to change my Twitter name, right? I was tired of passion for process. Maybe we'll take a vote. Should I change my name to passion for, get rid of passion for process, passion for digital? How many people like that? Jesus Christ. Okay, let's get rid of that one then, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's see how you, passion for design, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I hear like maybe zero for passion for digital, damn. Uh, okay, I hear about 20% for passion for design. Get rid of that. What about passion for passion? I like that one. Yeah, yeah, passion. Yeah, yeah. Nah, that's too boring. Uh, what I decided, though, is to stay with passion for process, actually. Um, and the reason I share this is fundamentally what drove me to leave Forrester was inquiries that I was getting from clients like this. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, this was, I probably got, and Derek, you can relate to this, getting inquiries from clients, and it's kind of like 30 minutes of uh, technology therapy, if you will, right? And clients ask me, like, oh, this digital, this design thinking, all this stuff sounds really great. Like, where do I go to get trained up on it? And I'm like, right? You can go, there's other, there's places, you can go to GA, you can go to all these places. Most of those places don't really get the digital operational side, right? They don't talk to CIOs, General Assembly. How many of you are familiar with General Assembly? Nobody? Wow. Uh, Galvanize, okay, okay. General Assembly is a, uh, they're kind of a digital skills accelerator, but they focus more on marketing uh, digital skills or digital marketing skills, right? And so when companies were asking me this question, you know, how do I, how do I shift my team of 80 process experts to become design thinkers? Or how do I transition people, uh, my BPM program, to be a digital center of excellence? You know, and I'm like, I, I wish I could tell you my job is just to get you excited about the stuff and then I go home, I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's the end of the story, right? J Jim's laughing because he's like, you hit it right on, Clay. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I think at some point I just got tired of telling people like, yeah, just go figure it out or here's a company here and a company there and just say, you know what? I actually want to roll up my sleeves and start helping people make this transition, right? Um, and what I saw also is, this is to me one of the biggest challenges right now, is we, we have these new challenges, we need new tools, but we haven't really defined the new tools. So if, if you think about this, these items as the different modes we take when it comes to building or maintaining applications, right? So when we focus on maintaining an application, application has been in, in use for the last 10 years, right? When we talk about maintaining, I was just talking to a customer about this recently, where they were saying, yeah, for our maintenance, we primarily use water, some form of waterfall and scrum. When we're implementing new technologies, we use some form of agile and scrum, right? When we start experimenting, what do people use? I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. When your customers are experimenting with some of the stuff that Neil was talking about, like what methodologies do they actually use? Do they use, do they do, I go to Bruce, do they do BPMN modeling for some of the stuff that this guy was talking about? Okay, just curious. <laughs> I mean, what do people use? They might use design thinking, but I, I guarantee you ask, I was just talking to a, a client about this recently, or a prospect, like, what do you guys use? Well, we use a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, bit. you know, it was like all over the place. There's no methodology. It's very ad hoc, right? Um, there's no recipe. There's no, but there's no, but there's no methodology. I'll say it like this. For, for BPM teams trying to make this shift, they can say design thinking, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly, like I can say this, I know how it works, I can speak the language, I did just I was at a conference a couple weeks back, met a client or a potential client, uh, prospect at the time, um, and it was interesting because I was saying, yeah, this is what we focus on, design thinking, blah, 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 and he was like, yeah, I took a design thinking IDEO class, right, and I know design thinking, and then when we talked further, it was like, he's not using it at all for what he's doing around business process, right? So. It's really, how do we get this going? And so I've been delving into this, right? You guys know I've focused on design thinking around brain, like being able to do brainstorming, observation, hypothesis design, it's pretty, pretty standard stuff. Also, uh, getting into helping teams with validation. So how many of you are familiar with Google Design Sprints? Yeah, this side of the room is on it, man. What's going on with you guys? Come on. 
uh, so Google Design Sprints, definitely recommend checking it out. It's not sprints like Agile, but it's more like a one week idea to prototype, validate it with decision makers in the room, right? Very, very good methodology for validating ideas when you're experimenting. Lean startup, we all know about low code prototypes. This part is, has been really interesting for me and starting to do research and work with clients on is, is this learn piece, like organizations, sorry if you can't see that down there, uh, but, but really trying to help organizations move very quickly through learning from the prototypes and the hypothesis they're testing, the experiments they're doing. Uh, I imagine most of you are familiar with Lean Cam Canvas or Business Model Canvas, right? It's pretty standard. How many of you are familiar with OKRs, right? This is an area, I started looking at this last year, but it's a very common technique in Silicon Valley, objectives and key results. And it's really the modern day version of management by objectives or KPI management. But the whole idea is to be able to use these metrics and objectives as a way to rapidly learn. So when you uh, look at Uber or look at Google or any of these companies that are moving fast, I, you guys apparently, I, I would imagine you're using OKRs? Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, they're using OKRs to be able to get the team together and move very fast around experiments, right? So it's, these are new methodologies. Every team, BPM team that I've talked to over the last couple months, if I bring these up, they're kind of like, I know design thinking, but what's this other thing, right? And so it's new methods we have to get these teams to start using to drive experimentation, right? The second piece here, and how am I doing on time? I'm good, right? Yeah. Um, the second thing here, it's not just about what we need to learn, what new needs to be learned, but it's also how we learn it, right? How many of you have gone to a, a technology or methodology training class lately? You've taught one lately, haven't you? Yeah. How many of you have gone? Okay. Okay. Most of the time, how does the class go? Bruce, how does the class usually go? <laughs> in, in the sense of Usually, and I used to be a trainer in past lives, but usually we give a lecture like, hey, here, do this, then they go do something, then they come back, right? I believe going forward, the way that we train people on new technology, new methodologies, it has to be both interactive and immersive, right? Interactive, if you think about these coding boot camps or hackathons, right? How many of you have been to a hackathon or hosted a hackathon, right? A lot of fun, you bring people together, everybody's like, yeah, it's really cool, you know, uh, or these sort of brainstorming sessions. But it also has to be immersive. How many people know what this is? Anybody want to take a guess at what this is on this side? <laughs> Pretty close, right? It's an escape room, right? And this is one of the things we started uh, talking to clients about is, hey, let's match up digital innovation boot camps with an escape room, right? How many of you have been to an escape room? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> You're no fun. It's for the kids. It's for the kids. Why didn't you enjoy it? The group dynamic. Yeah, that's true. That there are always somebody that wanted to be CEO of the escape room number one. It screws up the whole threat. I just dealt with that in real life, so we were I'll share a different story with you, but yes. Uh, but the idea is, is that in an escape room, you go in, you have about 50 minutes, 60 minutes to solve a group of puzzles. So you see these people all over the place. There's puzzles in here. They're trying to figure stuff out here. You have about 50, 60 minutes to solve puzzles to get out of the room before something terrible happens, like the room runs out of air or a bomb drops, or I've gone to several of these, they all have something where it's like, okay, if this really happens, it would not be good for me, right? <laughs> like, like the mummy room runs out of air and you actually start thinking, is it like they close the door, is the door locked, <laughs> right? Um, and so what we started playing with is this notion of learning new digital skills in an immersive environment where it's very compressed amount of time and you're having fun at the same time. Right? So it's really gamification, if you will, of learning, 
but in a real world environment, right? And so just to give you an example, right before, uh, one of the last clients I worked with before I left Forrester was a company called Nestle. So you guys are probably familiar with Nestle, right? Um, and Nestle, what we ended up doing with Nestle is a two week digital innovation boot camp. So they were setting up a uh, digital center of excellence out in Silicon Valley. So if you think about Nestle based in Europe, uh, they wanted to have their project managers, business process analysts, really people that were reporting up to the chief digital officer, they were gonna send waves of people out to Silicon Valley for, I think it ended up being about six months to nine months stints. Go out to Silicon Valley, kick this off with a two week uh, digital innovation boot camp, right? So these are people that by all intents and purposes never learned anything about design thinking, lean startup, any of that, right? They were process experts, project managers, program managers, all of that. Um, so they send us out or give us this task like, hey, can you guys do this boot camp where you train them to become these digital experts? And I'm like, yeah, why not? It sounds, sounds cool, sounds fun. So we put together an initial, the first part of the uh, boot camp was a four day immersion where they came in, they learned all these skills, but the funnest part was actually getting them to go out of the building and interact with customers on the street, right? So it wasn't just, if you think about the going back to the escape room, it was immersive, interactive. They had to go deal with real world experiences. And it was just a lot of fun. They learned a lot throughout the process, the results. They were able to triple the volume of new digital innovation ideas as a result, so very rapidly in a very short period of time. And it also ac accelerated the speed to green lighting digital projects, right? So we were able to quantify this in terms of the benefit. What was really interesting though is talking to the, one of the project leads because I wanted to understand like, how did this impact your culture as a company? What really changed? And they were sharing that the, the executive team now was moving more funding to support projects that they were doing because they felt confident in the methodology and the practice, right? And so it was really interesting that some of the soft results were really more, our executive team is now behind us because they see we know how to go off and do this. And, I, I was able to run two of these workshops, two two-week workshops with them. And what was mind-blowing was seeing the first team that went through, a few of the people came through on the second one just to sit in and give their feedback. And some of the things they were doing in terms of just validating ideas, I mean, they were testing out ideas, just posting things on Quora. I mean, that's a great, very low fidelity way to test out an idea. Post a, a question on Quora, right? And <laughs> see what people say. If you get a lot of good feedback, hey. Um, but the real uh, eye-popping moment for me, uh, how many of you guys remember what, this is, what movie this is from? The, Ma the Matrix, close. Yeah, they did have bald heads in Minority Report too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, from The Matrix, and I, I wanted to find a, a good visual that could kind of give you what, uh, what, what happened uh, around this story where, so if, remember I said with, Nestle, we brought these guys in, taught them how to do things like lean startup, business model canvas, all this, right? And at one point, when we were working with the team, the team and we said, okay, you're gonna need to go out, validate some of your hypotheses around this new business idea, right? So they had a really, some of the teams had really good ideas, so they had to get out of the building, go talk to people on the, on the street. This was in San Francisco, right? So, Middle of San Francisco, your job, sharing with the team, you gotta go talk to 20 people on the street that you don't know, and you gotta ask them some very specific questions about your problem and potentially your solution, and you gotta get at least five of them to validate that they have this problem, right? This is lean startup all over. If you've seen Silicon Valley, the show, you know what I'm talking about here, right? So, so this one team, project manager of this one team, when I was sharing this with her, she almost had a panic attack. You want me to do what? It was like this, right? Like, you want me to bend the spoon? Like, no, uh, I'm not going out to talk to anybody. This is crazy, I don't do that, right? I stay in my cube. Um, 
And I just was like, hey, it's gonna be okay. Like, you're gonna have some people go, or you know, one of our team leads go with you. You guys are gonna do good. You know, don't worry about it. It's downtown San Francisco. Everybody's cool. Nobody's gonna bite you, right? Well, maybe one or two, but it's another story. So anyways, when the light bulb went off over my head was when she came back, right? And she was like, oh man, that was great. Talk to 20 people, 17 of them validated the problem. Right, like a complete different person came back, right? And that, that really said something to me that when we start talking about digital and getting people to apply and really use not just the technology but the methodology, it's about putting them out in the field, getting them to work with customers as they build this because it helps with the learning but it also helps in terms of them understanding like, okay, this is how this impacts somebody's life. Right? And so it, the immersive part is really critical. We also did, I mentioned, uh, we did an escape room. And so uh, most of you guys are familiar with Appian. I don't think Appian's here, but how many of you are familiar with Appian? I just want to see how many of you raise your hand. Like vendors like, ah. Um, but I had, most of you know Malcolm uh, Ross over at Appian, right? So Malcolm had asked me, like, right after I left Forrester, like, what are you going to do? You know, I see you're traveling and all this stuff, like, moving around. Like, what are you planning to do? I'm like, I want to do escape rooms meet, meet digital innovation boot camps. Malcolm was like, okay, <laughs> that sounds weird, but cool. Um, and I said, why don't we do something like this at Appian World, right? So at their conference. So we ended up putting on this zombie apocalypse escape room. You can see we actually hired real zombies, right? Um, and ended up building about 20 puzzles, got, <laughs> be, be careful. <laughs> um, and so what was really amazing about this is number one, when we worked with Appian to build the rooms, we built physical puzzles, but we also built digital puzzles. So people had to solve and learn new things about the technology to be able to get out of the room. What was amazing is we ended up running this two and a half days, 250 people through the room, right? Four rooms simultaneously. We actually were over capacity, right? And so what we found is people love learning in this way, right? It's a fun experience. They're able to get, get into the tool, play with features that they hadn't played with yet. Um, and just walk away in, in a very positive way. And so we did a, a net promoter score on this afterwards and ended up with the 60, which is for net promoters really high, right? Um, it's really pretty impressive. And so it's really funny. So we're starting to run these because we're getting requests like American University saying, hey, can you guys do a digital innovation escape room around some of the new technology we're thinking about just to teach the kids? Um, and so we're trying to, to balance those two things. It was a lot of fun. But what we learned, people love having fun while learning new stuff. Uh, competition drives faster and deeper learning, right? So really getting people in a room, we would post what was the fastest time, right? And then other teams would try to beat that time, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, groaning zombies create learning froth. Do you guys know what froth is in terms of like escape rooms? It's like, I didn't know this until I started researching escape rooms. It's basically when people come out of the escape room, they're like, oh, that was so good, I loved it. it was, ah. And I'm like, okay. Uh, but having zombies in the room actually created this learning experience where people were able to walk away and remember a lot more. So the thing here, so a lot of it you can see, yeah, we're, we're focused on uh, helping teams get the new skills needed to drive the new technology, but what is the role that technology needs to play in this migration, right? And so we know that the digital workforce is gonna be using these new technologies. So AI, robotics, low code, IoT, mobile, we talked about all of that this morning. But the question is, what else do digital platforms need to provide to be able to support experimenting in this way? Right? So if we look at this, here's some of the things I, I think the technology needs to be able to bring in. Obviously, rapid prototyping, tools already have that. I think OKR management or something like that is critical. How many of you have heard of Lean Stack 
or heard of, uh, basically it's a business model canvas platform. Like I love Lean Stack's model in the sense that it's a business model canvas, but it also has a section that lets you drive experiment sprints. So you can design sprints, design what is your hypothesis, what's the outcome you're looking for, and then measure it over time, which is really nice. And then hypothesis boards is just a way to be able to manage and track how you're progressing with experiments. Are you validating uh, the experiments? And so this is just from uh, the Lean Stack website. I thought it was good the way they were laying this out because, because ultimately where we start with teams is around this build, measure, learn. So if going to what Neil was talking about, if a team says, yeah, I want to experiment with some of those ideas, right? A lot of times they're not going to say, well, I'm going to put $10 million into this and then we're just going to go to the, go to the races on it, right? What they'll say is, okay, I think I got like a couple hundred or a hundred. Let's try to experiment with it, figure it out, find the right use cases, and then we scale it out. And so where I think that the digital platforms need to be able to support this or platforms should be able to support this is to support this sort of build, measure, learn loop while also helping teams be able to identify what did we learn and scale it out pretty quickly over time. I think that's right now, the big gap is there's tools out there that let you do this. There's tools out there that let you build as if you know exactly what you want. But where we need to close the gap is in here, All right? So, so going back to the crossing the, the Serengeti or crossing the, uh, the river, right, and going on this migration journey. I believe our job right now is to, is to help our customers with this migration, right? I mean, before I left Forrester, a lot of uh, what Neil was sharing, that was the same stuff we were seeing is it's about automation, right? I, even though I kind of cringed at what uh, Nathaniel said earlier, make America great again, uh, make America great again, that's horrible, make automation great again, right? Uh, I kind of cringed at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the message, not the message. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no political statements here. Uh, so, so I agree with the basic premise that automation is the path forward, right? But it's how do we enable people to automate in different ways, right? So it's not the old automation, if you will. It's this new connected automation that connects with the customer, customer journeys, and ultimately helping our customers get to these greener pastures is critical, right? And so this is my con new contact information. My official title is Chief Accelerator. I didn't give myself that, just so you know, uh, that was given to me. But if you want to reach out, definitely feel free. I'm, I'm here over the next few days too, so definitely feel free to connect. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Time for questions if you want questions.